Hey, it's Inspiration For You. Hello, welcome to the Inspiration For You PSO podcast. I'm Bryce Wolf. I'm a senior manager of industry solutions here at Unit 4, and I've got Sean Wendell with ERP Advisors joining me today to talk all about PSO and M&A. So, Sean, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Bryce. I'm glad we could uh, host you today in our office, and thanks to everybody for putting together logistics. This stuff is not easy. Yeah, no, (laughs) it's not. It's nice to be here in person, sharing the the room here in Colorado. You bet. Yep. So tell, tell me a little bit about yourself, Sean. How, how long have you been with ERP Advisors? What's your, what's your background? What's your experience? Yeah. Um, so I started with ERP. My first ERP project was in 1998 with PeopleSoft back in the day. Um, so I was a PeopleSoft implementer and then went on to work with J.D. Edwards and then PeopleSoft. And then in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, started working with sort of mid-size, you know, maybe up to a billion or so in revenue organizations that were looking at technology and just weren't sure what to do. So I decided after being part of kind of a lot of analysis projects, like, you know, customers really need somebody on their side during the implementation to help them run it and get into all the technical problems and issues. I'm sure some of those will come up today. We had clients that would go through M&A and transactions and then everything would blow up with ERP. So about 12 years ago, I decided to start ERP Advisors Group. We're independent, we're objective, we work with all the software vendors, but we always stick around for our clients' implementations and do the client side work. So implementation partners come in and do the configuration. We help the client to do whatever they need on their side. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. So that's so you work with everybody, multiple vendors, because really you have the client's interest in mind with it whenever it comes to vendor selection and then the overall deployment. That's exactly right. Right. So we don't have um, a, a force of different types of software vendor expertise in terms of implementation people on the bench, right? All of our people are really able to do really just about any software solution in terms of the client side implementation, because a lot of the issues that we've seen over the years are similar. So if we have handlings on how to go through and help a client through a lot of acquisitions, right? I would say even today, we have at least five clients that are actively acquiring additional businesses, services, businesses, other types of business, but a lot of services businesses. And I mean, it's hard, right? And they struggle with it. So we can come in and help with that. That's great. That's great. Okay. So you've really seen a lot then in the the M&A space within professional services organization. More times you think of an acquisition of a technology company acquiring another technology company. So it's really interesting to hear all of the M&A that's going on within the professional services space. Can you tell me about a a recent example, keeping it high level about something that you saw and then the challenges that were in place? Yeah, you bet. You bet. There's two companies in particular, um, both in different types of, of uh, uh, different PS types. How do I say it? They're kind of disciplines. Focus is different, right? Actually, I can think of a third too. Um, all of these firms, right, are, are looking at a lot of opportunity in the market. You know, after a certain point where an organization gets known for uh, being the expert in, around a service, Um, they get a lot of business that comes in so much so that they might not be able to fulfill all the demand, right? I mean, these are basic problems that go back thousands of years with businesses, Mm -hmm. but today it, it seems like even with this kind of wonky economy and changes that these three companies in particular that I'm thinking with are all getting more demand than they can supply, right? So that's the first thing. The other thing that we see is, and I, everybody's talking about this. I mean, we're, we're, this is a reality for us. It probably is for you all too. You know, getting really good people, it's, it's hard. There's great people out there, but they're busy. They're working on other opportunities. So the demand for people has increased across all these services firms and the compensation packages have gone up. So you have a, a shortage of people right? And then the third component is sort of automation that's happening too, that 
um, even in those three organizations I'm thinking of, um, the ability to automate kind of core processes really needs to catch up with what's more modern today, right? And that's why they call us and say, hey, we don't know what to do. What should we do? But when you look at those three factors together of um, a lot of demand, short supply, and a lot of manual stuff going on, right? That tends to lead an organization towards a technology decision, right? Right. But it also tends towards, hey, let's go out into the market and let's find other businesses that either do what we do so we can we can increase our demand or go to adjacent services so that while we're uh, focusing on healthcare customers in one area, we can bring in additional services for that same customer, the adjacent service uh, kind of a strategy. Okay. So do you see uh, these, these people that you work with, do they go to adjacent industries or technologies or both? Yeah, usually both, right? Um, but usually, um, especially kind of the other factor, which is still so interesting about our, our environment right now, is there is a lot of investment capital that's available to a really well-run, established organization that has a pretty decent EBITDA, right? Earnings before income tax, depreciation, amortization, and they want to grow. They can go get a private equity partner, a venture capital partner. And then they can take the capital to then usually go and start buying other organizations, right? And along the way, somebody says, whoa, our technology is outdated. Um, we have a lot of manual processes. And when we were this small, we could kind of get away with it. But now that we're this big, um, we, don't, we don't have to do that, right? Because the other thing that comes in is these organizations usually have a little bit more liquidity, especially after a big investment. So they can maybe take the time to do a new software rollout. Um, it's challenging. It's risky. Thinking of another conversation I had recently with a large accounting firm who was rolling out some new um, technology, and you know, you think about your your key people, like your 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 bread and butter people that are in the trenches digging away, and now we're going to give them new software. It's a little scary. Yeah. Um, it's yet another change um, factor that comes in. But again, there comes to be a certain point where you just can't not do it because you get so big, the inefficient processes, even if we can really resolve just a little piece, if we can make our people even 2% more utilizable, right, where instead of taking all this time to enter timesheets, we just make it easier to enter in timesheets, right? I mean, that's yeah. one of the benefits I think we've seen with Unit 4 is that the user experience is really nice, right? It's one of those apps that a person is going to go into and say, oh, this is great. You know, I, I, they get it done instead of spending 30 minutes or even an hour going back into their calendar or whatever. Um, they can get that done pretty quickly. So, you know, but, but overall, um, when we go back to that concept of just like you said, like this adjacent industries, um, you know, technology can sort of be a bridge to help with kind of facilitating at least the back office operational processes so that the front office, you know, you have entrepreneurs, right? And services people tend to be, um, they're client oriented, they're client focused, mm -hmm. right? So they usually think they know everything. At least I think that about <laughs> myself. I don't know about anybody else, but you have people that really are like, hey, I love helping people and I want to yeah. do it my way. And then, you know, either the acquirer company says, okay, that's fine, but here's the way we do it. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of factors that come into play because you're dealing with people. I think that's what I love most about the PSO industry is that you're, you're dealing with people that are, they're so dynamic. I mean, they've created businesses, they're out, you know, basically, you know, we, we always kid around about waving our hands, telling people what to do and hoping like, <laughs> heck, they do it, right? You know, right. you put together PowerPoint and everything else. But, you know, that that uh, the ability to bring together, to integrate these cultures, um, it's there is a science behind it. We can talk more about what we've seen for best practices, but, you know, it's hard. It's difficult for sure. And technology can help with it. OK, so then it sounds like when it comes to M&A for for PSO, especially there's three main factors. You've got the people the process and the technology that, that kind of brings it all together. Yep. So can you expand on each of those a little bit? Like what goes into the people side of it, the process side of it, the technology? So we can start with people. What are what are some areas that you like to, to see as a, a focal point? Yeah, that, that's a great framework to use, right? You sort of have the strategy at the top that says, go do these acquisitions, then it's a nice little framework to work with. 
Um, and I'll use very specific examples of what I've experienced. So I'm thinking of a firm that I worked with that was about a thousand people, and then they were kind of merged in, but not really. It was an acquisition of a firm that was about 3,000 people, so about 4,000 all in. And on the people side, that that um, integration has worked. It's been beautiful because the people saw eye to eye, right? From the leadership teams at the uh, the acquired firm to the acquirer, middle management, you know, newer people out of school, professionals in the field. Like there was a lot of fit cultural wise, but but just values wise on who they really were, and and that um, makes a big difference. Oh, it makes a huge difference, right? And yeah. and it's. It's, I mean, I don't know, this isn't rocket science, what we're talking about. I think every, a lot of people know that, but I do think it's, if, if, if that, if that magic isn't there, man, you just made it hard for everybody. It just makes it harder. You can work through anything, but yeah. boy, when you see those, those fits, like another services firm I'm thinking of, it wasn't as much of a fit. And you know what ends up happening then is usually the acquired organization starts to lose a lot of people. And sometimes that's part of the overall strategy, right? Synergy costs, right? Well, you know, it's okay if we lose this many folks because the acquired organization can support the business. So it really, you know, on the people side, it's it's easy to say, you know, the cultures need to fit. But the most important thing, I always try to find something different to say when we have these kinds of conversations. Right. And one of the different things I would say is, you just need to be methodical about how the cultures are going to come together or aren't and then decide how to handle that. So it could be that a, a services firm in the insurance industry who worked some adjust, with some adjusters recently and they want to buy a construction business in a, a specific part of the world. And, you know, insurance adjusters and construction folks kind of are, you know, two different types <laughs> a little of different. people. A little, a little different, different, right? But we know that. So then how do we structure the deal so that we leave some autonomy with the construction organization? And then the, you know, maybe they're only interfacing with a couple people back to the mothership, if you will, right? So on the people side, that's what I would say is that you really have to be conscious and clear on what is your integration strategy with people. Of course, don't bypass that and just go to technology and process. But but really look at what's really going to work here. That's that's what I would say on the people side for sure. Right, and especially for a services organization because you're not selling widgets, you're selling people and right. their expertise. So you have to make sure that the people all fit together. And it sounds like there's a couple different ways to go about it, which is why a conversation is a good thing to have when it comes to to the planning side of things to make sure that you take everything into consideration with current state of both organizations and then future state for the new organization as that's well. It. Yep. Yeah. You know, a funny analogy. I always kind of, my, you know, my wife and I are partners in ERP advisors. There's 25 of us. So it's not just mom and pop, but <laughs> we've got a lot of kids too, I guess though. <laughs> but it's kind of funny. We're, we're both um, in our second marriage. And so when we started um, dating, we sort of did that, right? Where we're like, okay, let's get the kids together and sort of see how it goes. Right. And they hit it off right away, thankfully. Right. But maybe they didn't, but we still wanted to be together so, you know, we're still going to be together, but how do you work it so that it still works? It's really the same kind of thing for right. sure. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's the people side. Yep. And it sounds like it, it can be different. It needs to be based on the organization. There's no one size fits all. So what about the process? Yeah. So process is really interesting. Again, you know, kind of uh, the uh, um, confessions from, a, you know, uh, an advisor, right? Process seems like it should be pretty easy. Um, I can remember, again, another services firm um, in the 90s when I was with uh, Accenture, two organizations coming together, and our job was to develop the go-forward business processes for the organization. No problem, right? So, you know, usually those conversations are, okay, we'll get the subject matter expert for uh, project life cycle process, let's say, right? From the from one business, we'll get the other subject matter expert from the other business, we'll bring them together and we'll just define what the new process is. No problem, right? It never goes like that. <laughs> You've been through this, yes, you know. I haven't seen anything go as smoothly as that. Right. It's always off the rails all the time. Uh, off the rails, <laughs> exactly, right? So so you see how, you know, the what ends up usually happening 
which isn't the best way, right? Again, it goes back to the people side is that there's a lot of conversations. And then we just say, you know, whatever the acquirer's process is, that's just what you're going to get. Sorry. You know, right. that's not the right way to do it per se. But, but if you can get the people again in the mindset of like, hey, we have a real opportunity here to do this right. You've learned a lot from your tenure at the, at the acquired organization. You've learned a lot from the acquirer's organization. And these are subject matter experts. These are people that live and breathe these, the, the project life cycle from. Right. You know, set up and controls and checking credit all the way to get the project set up and billings. And there's a whole that's a whole slew of stuff. Right. But if you can get those people to sort of say, OK, you know what? What we did in the past was fine for what the business used to be. Now, here's what the business is going to be. You know, the revenue is going to be more. You know, the services are going to be different. Right. So if we can look at that to be scene. And, and collaboratively sort of say, this is what we think works, right? And, you know, we'll usually come into a meeting and kind of say, hey, here's a start at something. You know, usually should have somebody. Usually it's kind of the smartest person in the room, frankly, where you just <laughs> say, hey, just put something together and let's start with a straw man. You know, right. that makes a huge difference. Because if you get a bunch of people in the room and they're at a table and you're like, okay, what process should we do? They're like, oh, I'm going to go back to my emails, right? <laughs> but if you have something um, and, and, you know, kind of the best practice that we do is just get a process you know, put together, we use uh, lucid, which is, uh, it's like a Visio, but in the cloud, love that app, right? Um, we put together a process, and then we put it on a big piece of paper and throw it on the wall, and then get all the subject matter experts in the room and just look at the process, give them a pen, and say, what do we need to change? Okay, right? That's a great way to do process definition at a tactical level. And do you start with a with an understanding of the two organizations? Do you start with discovery? So that way you can take what they're doing today for a current state, kind of digest that and then come up with a, this is what we at ERP advisors think you should start with yep. and then start the conversation there. It, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. That, there's, we'll take the time um, to really get into the why the process is set up the way it is. And then say again, for this new situation, what's different about either organizations to what's going to be? And then just like you said, sort of say, hey, here's kind of an ideal scene, uh, you know, as is to be a little bit of a gap analysis. I was a Michael Hammer guy back when I was with Accenture in the 90s. That methodology works, but but there's a there's a scrum or an agile view too that you have to put on top of it. And if you have a consultant, they can help. But even if you don't have a consultant, like I said, Usually, maybe it's one or two people, but if if the one or two people that are sort of leading the effort can take a crack at that first diagram, oh gosh, it makes things so much better. And start high level. <laughs> Don't you see a lot of people when they do the process definition? I mean, I've got a lot of war wounds from all this stuff. It's good for me to have these conversations. Thank you for <laughs> letting me share it, right? Because God, how many meetings have I sat in? You're like, oh my gosh, we're like way down in this little detail. You and start with the approval process. The it's, approval no, process. No, 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 bring it up, bring it up. What are we approving? Like we, maybe we don't even need that approval anymore, right? The right. system does it or whatever. So start high level, get, get agreement. We call it on a gradient, right? At a high level, this is what we're going to do. Great. Then go to the next level. We agree. Great. Then go down from there. Okay. All right. So so that's the process side of things. Any other little tidbits, things to look out for when it comes to the process definition? Um, again, kind of thinking through some of my own experience and what hasn't worked. I remember working with a uh, pro service, pro serve firm in Durango, Colorado, kind of a smaller niche kind of a firm that was looking at acquisitions. And um yeah, I think just this concept of like, don't take the process definition personally. Right. It, you okay. really have to remove kind of, but I know this is what works best. And, <laughs> you know, you're not taking my process. So therefore you don't like me. I mean, that sounds silly to say that. But when you're in the middle of it, I mean, you've yeah. been there too. People yeah. can get pretty passionate. It, it's your it's your baby. It's exactly. if, especially if it's your company, if you're high up in the organization, right. you've helped craft this process for this successful organization that's now being acquired, or you're the acquirer and you've got this great process that's really worked. You're profitable, which is why you're acquiring a company. That's right. So yeah, it's definitely definitely tough to separate that out and not take it personally. So I can understand that. You got it. Yep. Yeah. And that's where the people side comes in too, right? You got to make sure that you have that culture fit, that you've got the culture defined. 
bring that process in as part of it, define the new process that's going to be going, which then leads us to technology. Mm -hmm. So you've got the people, the process, we have a good understanding of what comes into play there. So then how does technology fit? Yeah. I, and I, I actually think the order that you said that is absolutely the right way to do it too. Um, it's very easy, I think, for organizations to say, okay, we've come together, neither app works, let's go buy a new app, right? Um, but if you skip that people side and you skip the process side and you go right to the technology, when you start talking to vendors and start doing demos, guess what? You're going to have people problems. You're going to have process <laughs> problems. So, um, so that's the first tip I would say is let's get at least some definition around people and some agreements on process, then go to market and look at technology. But also, of course, say, look at our legacy apps first, right? It, because at least, uh, what is it? The, 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 the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush or the devil, you know, is better yeah. than the one you don't. Maybe yeah. that's the better analogy, <laughs> no offense, but you have two organizations that have been working with their tech stack for a while. So at least we know something about these two apps, right? So I would really start with those. I would really, and I mean, we're kind of an unusual firm in that we're like, Hey, you got to change apps. No, 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 not unless you absolutely have to. Right. And a lot of people have to, unfortunately, but start with those two apps. And again, with your people, your process and sort of say, hey, can either of these apps fit? And again, you may have the incumbent or the acquire, acquired company say, well, yeah, mine will work. Okay, that's good. <laughs> but why? You know, the, ask the why questions and really look at what the differentiators are. Um, I would say, you know, during an acquisition where there's a major integration project. Now, again, we're seeing a really best practice kind of a model of, you might even acquire a business, but leave them on their legacy technology platform. And you can do integrations through kind of a, um, through kind of trial balance on the accounting side, maybe with some accounting transactions. And you can do kind of operational data integration through like a data warehouse. Um, that's kind of, kind of sits above everything, right? We've seen that model work really, really well for some in industries or some sub, I should say, industries and services. Um, and just organizations that are maybe moving really fast, maybe their time frame for the next transaction is short. So they might not have time to put in new software, right? It's something right. that should be considered. Because it's a long lead time. It is. It can be. It can, it be. can be. It can be. You yeah. bet. You bet. You bet. It can be short too, I think, as you're um, insinuating, which is true. Um, and there are other instances where you really do need to roll out the single platform across the new enterprise, right? Right. And, and that's an interesting strategy, especially if you're making lots of acquisitions, right? I um, was just talking to a company on uh, Friday that is doing a, a major acquisitions throughout the country. And their their strategy has been to roll them onto their application that they currently use, but that current app is legacy. Mm. And so they're thinking, oh, you know, if we're going to do a lot more acquisitions, do we really want to put them on this legacy app that might not be supported into the future? Or do we change? Right. Right. I mean, these are hard, yeah. hard and decisions then that to looks make. Back up the uh, up to the process side of things. And does this legacy technology then fit this new process that we want to do? Exactly. Or are we fitting our process to our technology, which is definitely not something we want to do. We want to be able to have our process and then have the technology that supports that process. That's right. Yep. Especially if you have really differentiated processes. And, and and this is another really, really important tip. We were just at a services firm in Florida two weeks ago, and their model is, is very unique in how they're driving services. And I think a lot of services business are looking for kind of more recurring services. So it almost looks more like a software company, um, but right. it's services as a service. <laughs> there you go. That's a new one. <laughs> Instead of software as a service, it's service as a service. Service. Everything as a service. Everything as a service, <laughs> right? Um, and, and as we're kind of diving in on sort of their requirements and how the technology supports that, um, they have a really unique opportunity to leverage some of this kind of next generation software where it's not just time tracking and billing, Right. But how do we bring in these these subscription services that we're offering and get lights out billing around that? Right. We've worked right. with a lot of telcos and data centers and that. But I loved seeing that model for basically a PSO 
that's totally shifted to this new model, very profitable yeah. um, and sustainable. And, you know, they're uh, PE backed um, and I know they're going to grow a lot. So it's really cool to see that technology, how it can support kind of what that business model is going forward, even though it's a little bit different. Right. So, so having that next generation technology, it sounds like is key to be able to support the process to be able to make sure that the technology can adapt and change as the process does, because the process, the way that it's set today is not necessarily the way that it's going to be tomorrow. And you need a technology to be able to support this process that can evolve with you as you do as an organization. Exactly. I'm thinking as you're saying that, like, well, why is that such a problem? That's easy, right? <laughs> and, and you know, the reality is, again, you've lived this, right? You were with one of the top, I think, uh, uh, PS, best of breed solutions, not a platform, um, you know, in the market. But then, you know, you look at where organizations like Unit4 are taking kind of this comprehensive platform. Because what, what you and I are talking about is, is, there's, it's conceptual, right? There's, these are the things you have to keep in mind as you're attacking these problems. But then when you get to like the practical world of like maintenance on a software solution, right? And right. you get to integrations and the maintenance of integrations even and master data management. I mean, all the yucky stuff that we, <laughs> that we have to deal with to right? make these projects go. When you do have a really strong platform, um, I will tell you, uh, like we look at best of breed, all in one or hybrid solutions for every client. And we prefer the hybrid because not one app can usually do everything, right? It just, it, there's so many best of breeds and they are fairly easy of to course. plug in. But the more software we can get in a platform, there's less throats to choke, right? There's less worries of the CIO about, you know, service level agreement and, and compliance. Cybersecurity and, and integrations breaking and integrations and, breaking, which happens all the always, time. It's always it's always the struggle. That's right. It's always a struggle. Any software deployment, you have the individual the individual package, and it works great as it's designed. Everything's fine. It's when you have a lot of integrations right. that you tend to see more of those challenges with it. Not that it's impossible, because there are many great integrated solutions out exactly. there. Exactly. But the more that you can have in one place, it sounds like from what you're saying. The more you can have in one place, the better off you are. And like I said, eight, nine times out of 10, that's what we're going to recommend. Um, because on top of the people issues, the process issues, now we're adding technology and we're going to add six to eight applications and integrations and different parties and different people. And again, just normalizing data. We have to migrate data from the old systems to the new systems. Like across multiple organizations, across multiple organizations and a project over here does not equal a project over there. So right. we have to normalize those, then bring them over. I mean, you and I have kind of lived this stuff. I think you can <laughs> tell from our, our, yes. our recommendations here that, you know, the less amount of technology that we're introducing, the complexity, the better. I, like I said, very, very, very rare for us to do a super complex um, ecosystem because you know we we actually care about people and somebody <laughs> has to maintain all this stuff going forward so couldn't agree with you anymore right okay <laughs> awesome all right so so Sean just to summarize it we've got M&A we're seeing it more and more yeah. in the PSO space we've got whenever it comes to that conversation of what company do we buy that services we look for a, kind of an adjacent technology adjacent industry or maybe we just grow by acquiring somebody mm -hmm. that does the same thing we can only take on so much business with our team. So we look to to take somebody on and, and acquire a company like that. And then when it comes to the, the strategy of the actual acquisition, we've got three main pillars. We have our people, our process, and our technology. Yeah. And really from, from what you said, it sounds like that is the right order to look at it. Obviously it's not true hundred percent of the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there, there's a, an exception to every rule you as bet. they say, you bet. but we want to look at it from that lens of people first and then the process, and then make sure that we have a technology that is flexible, that will support our people and our process. That's spot on. And, and again, I think the, the most important thing that I've learned <clears throat> that I would love for everybody to understand from being in the trenches of trying to integrate businesses and PS is 
when you look at the people, be willing to look at what actually is, not what you want it to be or what it should be. You have to look at what actually is. And it's very easy to get people in a room and watch, but somebody has to be exterior to it and look in and say, oh my gosh, these guys are the exact same language. They're getting along They're, You know, it's hard to work because they're hanging out. I mean, that's like, hallelujah. That's amazing. <laughs> right. That's one extreme. The other extreme is they're sitting there like this, not saying anything. And you're somewhere in between. Yeah. But, but if you can really understand, you know, how your integration teams are going to work together, then you can start making some other decisions, right? Like don't do a lot of process and technology change unless these champions are willing to be the champions, right. are really willing to work through the challenges <clears throat> and get to you, get the organization to an ideal scene. Sometimes they're not. So just lower the expectations. I mean, it's easy for me to say because I'm not the investor in this business. It's like, okay, I gave you this much money. Now I need this much back in this <laughs> amount of time. But I, I again, I, I think at the end of the day, and I think this is why we both love uh, PS Ferns, PSO, is because it is about the people. And if we can align the process, the technology back to the people, it sounds so cliche, but the real people and what's really going to happen, right? right. I, again, I'm thinking of another services firm that came together. It was supposed to be a merger of equals. And then within about a week, it was very clear that there was an acquirer and acquiree. I've seen that. I've seen it, I've right? Seen that. Right. <laughs> and the acquiree, then the people are like, whoa, they really don't care what I think. And I'm just, I'm going to be honest here to say they really didn't. It, it was irrelevant. Right. The speed and the return that needed to happen was basically like, we're going to bring you into our platform, whether you like it or not. And, and that strategy, it made a ton of sense for where those organizations were. We were going through a, an ERP selection at that time too. Um, and we picked a platform that everybody was going to move to, but it was basically taking the, the incumbent business and putting their processes in the new and the one that was acquired just because there were best practices. It's a little bit of the, the bigger fish eating the smaller fish. But again, all I'm trying to say is, is, this isn't rocket science. Your people are going to tell you what they're willing to do if you're willing to listen um, and then drive your decisions from there. And some of the decisions might be you need to bring in new people, but hopefully not. Hopefully the right decision is you have great people that understand your industry. They understand the business. Now you've doubled it. Let's leverage these folks to put together the right thing because, I mean, there isn't – there isn't a, I'm trying to think of, if I think of all the services firms for clients and we work with a lot of implementation partners too, mm -hmm. um, 90% of them are making acquisitions or merging. Everybody's going through this effort and I think it's going to continue. There's a lot of value in it. So just keeping these key things in mind, I think it's helpful. I really do. Okay. Awesome. Good. Well, I'm sure we could sit here and exchange war stories for, for right. hours, but <laughs> we're we're coming to to everybody here from Colorado. So, you know, a bit on the fun side, what do you like to do? What are your Colorado activities, if you will? Oh, yeah, I love that question. Well, um, unlike uh, Will, who I always pick on on our calls, who likes to do more cool things, um, <laughs> just this morning, uh, uh, actually right behind us is what's called Green Mountain. And I, uh, I got to do a bike ride up there, um, kind of took some time before getting on calls. So a, a couple of years ago for a pretty, it was a not a big birthday, but big enough where I could justify getting a nice mountain bike. So I love to mountain bike around here in this area. It's perfect. And uh, we usually go to Morrison is right around the corner on the weekends and walk our dog. So, you know, just like every Colorado and it's be outside and yeah. enjoy the weather. Don't tell anybody about how nice it is though. Um, I think everybody yeah, It's always knows. cold and windy and snowy. <laughs> like it's just snow. absolutely terrible. There's like six feet of snow out right now. Yeah, as definitely. you can see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If, you, if you can see through the, the blinds there, you definitely That's see right. all the snow. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's great. Well, I appreciate your time today. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for, for joining for the inspiration for you. M&A for PSO talk here with Sean from ERP Advisors. Make sure you smash that like button and subscribe to the Inspiration for You podcast. I'm Bryce Wolf with Unit 4. Thank you. Thank you.